Good evening, everyone. On behalf of IMC Chamber of Commerce and Industry, SPJN, IMR, and Rupa Publications, I'm delighted to write to invite all of you to this evening's webinar on the launch of three extremely well-written books by Mr. R. Gopalakrishnan. We had planned this event on 26th March, but we all know what happened on 25th March. We were hit into the lockdown, and so this had to be delayed. These books have been co-authored by three writers. I'll come to them by and by. I'm glad we are doing this webinar today and launching all the three books. The first book, How Anil Nayak Built LNT's Remarkable Growth Trajectory, written with Professor Dr. Pallavi Ben Modi. I'm sorry, Dr. Pallavi Ben Modi. I'm proud to have known Pallavi Ben since the past 40 years, and also we are family. In these lockdown times, her husband Ashok Bai and daughter Ruju who are architects, and I have been working on remotely on some awesome building projects. As they say, we will discover new ways of doing business and our professions in these troubled times. And necessity, after all, is the mother of invention. I was given the book on Mr. Anil Nayak two months back, and I almost, and I must confess, I got to read it only on the first few days of the lockdown. The way Mr. Nayak built LNT is incredible. Also, LNT was founded in 1938, and guess what happened soon after? You know the World War II happened. And because of that, in 1939, they had to reinvent themselves at the very start of their industry. They went to Dharavi with the molds of the machines which they had from Germany and replicated them and got business back in action. Also in the 1980s, they had to face a hostile takeover by the Chabria brothers, that is Manu Chabria and Kishore Chabria of Dubai, who later sold their stake to Mr. Dhirubhai Ambani. Then the Ambanis sold their stake 20% almost to Mr. Kumar Manglam Birla in 2001. It was then that Mr. Naya came out with the strategy of splitting LNT into the cement division and the engineering division. And what a great move he'd made. He sold, he split the company and he gave Mr. Kumar Manglam Birla the entire cement division and the engineering division he held in the Employees Welfare Trust. And that's how he saved LNT. And the rest, as we know, is history. And we all know what LNT is today. The next book on TCS, how TCS was built, has built an industry for India with Tulsi Jayakumar. TCS is the, the foremost technology company in India and the Kohinoor in the Tata Empire, as they say. It today clocks revenues of 150,000 crores and has a market 150,000 crores and has a market cap of 7 lakh crores. Even in this, when the markets are crashing, I think TCS has fallen the least in this whole market. So you know what TCS is all about. And I'm proud that whenever you go to any country in the world, you'll always see a TCS office almost anywhere in the world. The third book, How Kiran Mazumdar Shaw Fermented Biocorn, is written with Sushmita Srivastava. Biocon is a leading pharmaceutical company manufacturing generic active pharma ingredients sold in 120 countries. The market cap is today in excess of 50,000 crores. Mr. Gopalakrishnan has a wide experience of 31 years with Hindustan Levers and 19 years with Tata, with Tata Sons, and now is the non-executive chairman of Castrol Limited. I mean, what more can you ask for? Sir, it is an honor to have you with us on this webinar. And we look forward to hearing from you all about your rich experience in your long and distinguished career and on these books. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashish. That is very kind of you to thank you uh, for IMC to invite uh, me and my two co-authors uh, to this webinar. I'm sorry, the third person, third author, is not able to join for this particular occasion. So I will do the best I can to double up on her behalf. But first of all, I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here for the second time. The last time, thanks to Tanil Kilachan and uh, Raj Nair, we were able to launch uh, uh, our book, uh, Made in India Manager. And so this is the second time that IMCCI is inviting SPJN, sponsor, uh, not sponsored, but SPJN authored books, uh, faculty of SPJN. And it's a novel way in which IMC has... Uh, chosen to continue its service to members. My congratulations and best wishes for the future. It is actually wonderful to see how citizens 
and organizations and NGOs are helping the poor to mitigate the very disastrous situation that has uh, arrived. Uh, everything that is being done added together is not good enough. And yet every single act is so immensely touching and valuable. I pray and I'm sure all of us join in this prayer that this too shall pass with the least possible mayhem and difficulty. In these very difficult times, we are, some of us privileged people have got the privilege of having a spare time to think. We have thinking time as never before. And as executives who are working in companies or running companies, how can we use this time to advantage? And one idea which we would like to propose for your consideration is the following. Assuming that you work for a good company, what can you do and what can your colleagues do to make this good company into a long-standing institution? And is there a difference between a company and an institution? So that is the question we asked ourselves two and a half years ago. Obviously, we didn't know there's going to be a lockdown. And um, the faculty of SPJN formed teams with us and I also joined the teams. And we have uh, come to a piece of research which will be described to you later as a research methodology by one of my co-panelists, Dr. Sushmita Srivastava. But I just wanted to give you a little uh, helicopter view of what the project is about and to say a few words about TCS because our TCS co-author is not able to join this particular webinar. So Pallavi, may I have the first chart please or the second chart? Yes. Yes. I want to explain to you what is the difference between a good company and a business institution. The next one, please. In our uh, management uh, world, we are quite commonly using jargon. And therefore, I want to make sure that we don't fall into that capacity, in that, into that trap. There's a big difference in our view. What is institution building is something about we want to explain and how should the management mindset change if we want to think through the difference between a company and an institution. See, on the whole, we know that a happy society is one where there is enterprise, which means business, which generates wealth legitimately. Education, I use education to mean culture, cultural development of population. And a Greek word called eudaimonia which the Greeks used to suggest well-being, a feeling of happiness. These three together form a happy society in any philosophy you come across in the world. Business institution, therefore, is very key for growth and job creation. But unfortunately, we have a number of uh, what I call Gen C companies, Generation Centurion, who have been around for 100 years, 150 years, Tatas, Birlas, Godrej, Bajaj, and so on and so forth. But what we wanted to inquire into, where are the Gen L companies which have become institutions or which show signs of becoming an institution? A Gen L company is intended to suggest generation liberalization, which really took off either just before or during liberalization or soon after. Those are the companies that we wanted to do our research on. Next slide, Pallavi. And therefore, our first question was, what's the difference between an institution and a company? You have to imagine what's an institution. Just think of Red Fort compared to a modern bungalow. Think of Victoria Terminus Station in Mumbai compared to Khandala Railway Station. Think of the Taj Mahal in Agra and compare it to an ordinary Kabristan, a graveyard. You can easily conjure without using fancy definitions of what is the difference between an institution and a good company. An institution suggests it is grand, it is awesome, it is durable, and a good company is like nice, it's adequate, it's pleasing. So it is not that uh, it is not required. I don't want you to get the impression that good companies are not required. Don't get me wrong. But good company is a, is a, is a, is a, is a station on the way to 
uh, a higher aspiration, which is to become an institution. Go to the next slide, please, uh, Pallavi. So when I when we debated this question at one of the faculty meetings, uh, I'm going to run through this very quickly because Dr. Srivastava will be talking about the research methodology. Academics are better equipped to talk about this than I. They studied all the research literature and produced a fair amount of paper uh, of what other people have said about um, uh, institutions. But then we sat down together uh, and conceptualized a model. As you know, the beginning of any research is to conceptualize or hypothesize something. And we conceptualize what we call the mindset behavior action grid. This also happens to come to the acronym MBA, but it's not the MBA that we associate with IIM or management schools. It has to do with uh, mindset, which causes behavior, which in turn causes action. And then I went out and talked to four or five uh, CEOs, very established uh, and respected CEOs, to validate whether what we have arrived at is sounding sensible. We then selected some institutions which we thought we should uh, study. We did field interviews and then six uh, Gen L CEOs and business institutions agreed to cooperate in uh, our research and give us the uh, support. Uh, just for your information, why are these institutions so important? The six that we have happened to have selected account for 2 million direct jobs in the country. They account for 10 million indirect jobs and their market capitalization of 30 lakh crores accounts for a very high percentage, 15% or so of the 140 lakh crore market capitalization in the Bombay Stock Exchange. So if I add the Gen C companies and the Gen L companies, you'll find that you covered probably 80, 90% of the market cap. And that's the reason why we need more and more Gen L institutions to come up so that we get a broader based market uh, in the stock market also. The six companies where the CEOs agreed to uh, collaborate with us on the research were TCS, read uh, Mr. Kohli and Mr. Ramadurai, uh, Biocon, read Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Larson and Tubro Group, read Anil Nayak. And those three are completed. HDFC Group with Deepak Parikh is going on, it hasn't been published yet. Marico with uh, Harsh Maribala is also a work in process. And the last one is Kotak Bank, which uh, is also a work in progress. Those will come out later in the month of uh, maybe July or August when things normalize. So I want to tell you a little bit about the Mindset Behavior Action Grid because that became the central compass through which we navigated the research project. So may I have the next slide please, which will probably be my last slide anyway. So this describes to you what is the mindset behavior action grid. You'll see there are three vertical columns. The first one says mindset. Uh, the second one says behavior. And the third one says action. Whatever is your mindset causes you to behave in a particular way. And whatever is your behavior causes action. So the arrow moves, the energy moves from the left to the right. Then you will find that in the selection of the companies, we, we had to have some uh, criteria. We said that it must, have the, the, it must be a Gen L company and the person who shaped it or took it forward must be alive for us to interview. So obviously going to Jamshedji Tata or uh, uh, Godrej was not uh, valid. Those could not be included into our uh, study set. It must have high values and behavioral norms, which is greatly admired in the market. It must withstand the pressures of finance, business and regulation, and it has demonstrated an innate resilience. And lastly, it's economic and stakeholder return. And this is a very important distinction between our study and some of the ones done abroad. Need not be at the top of the pile. They must be amongst the top of the pile because there is much more to an institution than just high returns and ROC and ROE. So those were the criteria. And you'll find on the left, in the deep blue, the eight rows are there. One is called people relations, that's the first one, which essentially means you're respectful to others. The second is called short and long term, that is you're able to manage both simultaneously. 
The third one is called critical thinking, which means you consider options beyond the obvious. And the fourth one is called orbit shifting. The fifth one, go to the next chart, please. Is called breaking barriers. The sixth one is identifying the levers of change. The seventh one is cyclical learning. And the last one is stakeholder orientation, not just shareholder orientation. Now, each of these has a long explanation, and that's contained in the book. Every copy of the book has a, a, this chart reproduced in the appendix, along with what our research methodology was. And that will be explained in a moment by my colleague, Dr. Sushmita Srivastava. So I will stop here with uh, explaining our methodology and say a few words about the company where my co-author is not here, Tata Consultancy Services. And you can close this, uh, Pallavi, because I don't need the charts anymore. DCS, <clears throat> because it is such a bellwether in the stock market, we all assume that DCS has been around for a long time. Well, it was born only in 1968, soon after I began my career. <laughs> so it has happened under my nose as it were. Luckily, uh, we have all been the beneficiaries of this. And it happened in a nation where if you cast your mind back, there was a scarcity of food, electricity, infrastructure, you name it. The TCS book, describes our perception of the rise of TCS as a black swan event. Nicholas Taleb made this word back, black swan uh, eponymous, which meant that uh, it was an event characterized by rarity. It doesn't happen often. I have to tell you that the current uh, coronavirus epidemic is also a bit of a black swan, unfortunately, but that one is a nice one. It was characterized by rarity, uh, extreme impact, as it's turned out, and retrospective predictability, which means that in hindsight, it looks as though it had to happen, but it wasn't so obvious at all at the time it began. Now, our, the effective founder of DCS is Fakir Chand Kohli. God bless his soul. I don't know if he's listening to this uh, uh, webinar. We did, uh, I didn't bring it to his notice, but he's the effective founder of DCS. He turned 96 just last month, and uh, we were very fortunate to be able to interview him and Mr. Ramadurai. Now, Mr. Kohli had the shaper's technical knowledge. Uh, and he also had the knack of seeing gaps. Mr. Kohli was a bit like a batsman who watches on the cricket field, where some batsmen watch where the fielders are standing. But some batsmen watch the gaps between the fielders, because that's where they want to hit the ball. And Mr. Kohli seems to have been a bit of the latter variety. So he could iteratively shape the environment in which he was operating his company and well as adapt his organization, his company to do that. You see, the initial plan of TCS was to import computers. Remember, we were very, very short of foreign exchange in those days and serve Indian companies by deploying uh, computers for uh, improving the efficiency and through electronic data processing. But the atmosphere for computers at that time was uh, totally anti. I mean, I began my career with uh, computers, in, not in TCS, but in Hindustan Deva. And, uh, you know, we were seen as uh, monsters, a bit like people with artificial intelligence are seen today, as they're going to take away all the jobs. LIC, for example, uh, public sector behemoth, imported their computer, but they couldn't even take it in Calcutta out of the cardboard boxes. The union wouldn't let them. Calcutta was very militant at that time. And therefore, uh, TCS had to do something different. And it did what in startup language nowadays is called pivoting. It pivoted and changed its model to saying that we will look for customers outside and earn foreign exchange. And that is how TCS, in my opinion, in our opinion, invented the offshore model. I think the credit for the offshore delivery model must be placed at the door of uh, Mr. Kohli and Mr. Ramadurai and their successors. By 1996, we are not, I, I, I will obviously like to be brief in view of the time availability, but by 1996, Mr. Kohli had groomed his successor and uh, a person who was uh, about 20 years younger than him, and that is Mr. S. Ramadurai. And uh, at that time, Mr. Ramadurai, when he took over, the revenue of TCS was 90% overseas. He deployed 8,000 people, which is quite a large number by the standard of those days. And its revenue was $160 million, which also looked quite large at that time. 
it is looking dwarfed only because TCS has grown so very well subsequently. But it had engineered profitability, and this is a very important point, through frugality and through customer value focus. And it is these two bases that allowed it to grow. TCS was never called a unicorn because we didn't know what that word meant in those days. But TCS uh, had a shareholder in Tata Sons who was not trying to infuse dollops of cash to support losses as sometimes happens these days. Between 1996 and 2009, when Mr. Ramadurai retired from executive position and handed over to Chandrasekhar, TCS multiplied its revenues and employee strength in many fold. And it rode the Y2K wave. As you know, in 2000, there was the Y2K wave. And what TCS did, which is a reflection of its critical thinking, is that it converted software development, which was a bit of an artisanal thing before that, into a factory like repeatable, precise, efficient process. This uh, company, TCS, had its IPO only in 2004. So we tend to forget that it's only 15, 16 years old in the public domain. And it had a starting valuation of $2 billion. Thanks to frugality, efficiency, discipline, TCS enjoys today a market capitalization in three digits of billions of dollars. And it employs not 8,000, but half a million people. And all this without the fuss of ever being called a unicorn. Like we instill things in our children at home, right from childhood, uh, TCS, and therefore it becomes a model for this, must consider doing the right thing right from the beginning. The first essential thing that TCS did is people relations. They knew that they survive only because of people. And there's a high degree of people orientation, which is of course described uh, in the book and evidence by the fact that they've had four successions of people who are 10, 15 years younger to their predecessor. A bit like I've observed even in Unilever, but Unilever is not a subject of study in uh, our research. Um, the second one is dealing with short and long term simultaneously, which is the ability to have a counterintuitive mindset. You see, we human beings are the only species which have been created which have a thumb and a forefinger. And because of this combination, we are able to do many things. Every other species have them on the same plane. So this is what I mean by a counterintuitive sense. We are able to grapple, grab things, do things with the uh, opposable sort of uh, devices. And this is the kind of mindset that uh, uh, GCS displayed when the Y2K came. And a good example of this is the way a mother raises a child. All our wives, our daughters, our daughters-in-law, raise children, keeping the child quiet for the moment, but always dreaming about what the child will become when it grows up. And the third aspect I just want to highlight is critical thinking, which is the ability to develop new options. The ability to develop new options um, when obvious options. And this is well reflected in the way that they responded to the Y2K opportunity and the TCS reckoned it was both a hardware and a software problem and it is possible to automate it. So based on customized software, TCS had several migration tools in its repertoire. It was essentially a mainframe computer problem. So TCS established a software factory at Chennai to handle at that time 650 million lines of code. I've had the privilege of visiting that factory uh, in its early days, soon after I joined Tata's many years ago. And this was a very, very smart move which resulted in the revenue of TCS increasing during uh, that period from $125 million to $419 million just in a short time. So we have given you just a flavor of it and I think I should stop here because we have two other wonderful companies which have shown all the characteristics of an institution. So I'm going to request my co-author and colleague, Dr. Sushmita Srivastava, to tell you a little bit about the research methodology and then to talk about Biocon, a company which has literally come up under our nose. Dr. Srivastava, please. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Gopal Roshan, sir. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, yeah. Okay. So a very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much, INC and uh, the organizers for having given us, given us this opportunity to share about our books. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Uh, so, sir has already given and has already covered the genesis of our project, 
uh, what I would like to do here is to convince uh, some of our, uh, you know, uh, uh, researching client uh, viewers that uh, this book actually followed a research process and a design, uh, which is fairly robust. And uh, considering that it was written uh, by, along with the practitioner, the chances are that we would be, you know, more skewed towards being a practice oriented book, but not really so, because we have tried to ensure that there are some academic contributions as well. And I hope you get convinced about it. So what was the research objective? The research objective was, is there a distinction between an organization and an institution? And what is the difference between the leaders of these two entities? And that was a research objective. So from the research objective, we derived the research question. And a research question was very, very interesting. It said that if you had kept all the business leadership performance parameters identical between, the, between an institution and an organization, What's, why would then uh, these two entities have a different trajectory or a different process? And what would these process be? So having arrived at the research question and the objectives, we then thought about the process. As you could see in my slide, what was this process? So basically our process was twofold. Uh, one of course was experience before theory. We had uh, Mr. Gopalakrishnan bringing in his practical insights, which we had to marry with, a, with some amount of academic rigor. And the process that we followed for this uh, was an abductive research approach, uh, which was a combination of both inductive and deductive uh, reasoning. How did we design our project? Of course, like any uh, research uh, project, there was a pilot study where we threw upon a few questions to some of the, the industry leaders. These questions were uh, like, uh, you know, what is a characteristic or a hallmark of a shaper? Uh, how would you recognize a shaper? Who do you think can be qualified to be called a shaper? So from this, we derived an interview schedule comprising about 11 questions, the details of which is available in our book. And they, become in, they became, became important for us to do these in-depth interviews with our shapers and stakeholders. The questions were uh, more to do with the context of the business because we were right from pharma to FMCG to manufacturing. So there was a huge bandwidth. We tried to see what really... Uh, shape the shaper in that sense, what were the key influences on him? And then what was the reason why these companies moved on to a higher growth trajectory? Based on this, of course, we had a lot of data before us and it was important for us to triangulate the data and the data triangulation led to certain codes, certain themes, certain categories, certain uh, patterns. And all of that actually uh, some, uh, amalgamated into the shaper's construct and the eight variables uh, which uh, uh, Gopalakrishnan sir has just explained to us. So that was our uh, research process. And I would once again tally the fear that although it's a practitioner-centered book, uh, yet it does follow uh, some amount of academic rigor and discipline. And we are very hopeful that uh, you know, researchers in the area of leadership and organizational behavior uh, may like to take this forward. Uh, next, I would like to move to the one most critical dimension of the eight factors uh, that has just been outlined and of uh, which uh, 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 TCS also has been referred to, and that is critical thinking process. Uh, so Biocon, uh, as you all know, is, uh, uh, is being run by a woman entrepreneur uh, and uh, very jocularly said, you know, she's uh, he, uh, a woman entrepreneur who actually dabbled with the technology which was really unheard of in the 1970s. India was going through a times when uh, funding was an impossible task there was power and water supply shortages and all of it. And it was in this time that uh, Kiran Majumdar Shah comes with the technology, which, uh, which was a technology called Koji technology. She had to make a choice, a very critical choice between going for a affordable technology or an automated technology. And that choice was so critical that it has absolutely, you know, kind of uh, uh, changed the face of the industry. Today, Koji technology is not only patented by the US FDA, but it has given uh, the company the first mover advantage. Uh, so Kiran describes critical thinking process very well in our interviews. She, she says it's about going into a path which is embedded with fraught with risks. But then how do you de-risk an already risky path? And how do you then uh, try and uh, calibrate these risks such that taking them becomes worthwhile? So that, uh, and she gave examples to several other, other uh, such initiatives for example, getting into venture capital. Uh, you know, in those days, uh, she was always scouting for funds because it was not easy. 
And fortunately, uh, there was a black swan event. She does, does get that money. She, she tries to put it to use. She failed once, tried it again. And uh, all of us know that Biocon was a progeny of an Irish company, you know, to start off with. But over a period of a couple of decades, Biocon goes ahead and buys back the stakes from the parent company. Now, this is an interesting turn of events and could happen only largely because the ability to think critically at every stage. Uh, the other important interesting thing is about the enzyme business. So enzyme business, what this was what where, uh, you know, Biocon has always been. And it was a very forgiving technology, very easy, deregulated, but she decides to move to biopharma, which was far more complex, far more competitive. And this decision uh, to getting the buy-in of everybody was, was very, very, uh, truly very, very, uh, you know, uh, instrumental in bringing about change in the organization. Similarly, there are many other examples in the book where we see that uh, the critical thinking process uh, of uh, spotting an opportunity, defining the risks, managing, mitigating, and then scaling up the business has been, uh, is visible. And finally, I'd like to talk about the Biocon way, uh, which is the uh, compass and which explains the DNA of the organization. Uh, what is it about the Biocon way? So, you know, on the two sides of the slide, you would see some pictures. One is of a rainforest and the other is, uh, is a cell. Uh, so if you really look at the way Biocon has, uh, has emerged as an organization, uh, it has followed the principles of the rainforest. It's always focused on the long run. The rainforest always believes in effectiveness, you know, being a part of nature and not just efficiency, thinking long term. Similarly, thinking in very biological ways, which means that, you know, you, you try to adapt to situations and not just think in a cause effect mechanical fashion. Uh, so the way Biocon, uh, being a kind of a life sciences in a company, has gone about bringing about, uh, you know, change is interesting and has many lessons for companies in, in today's world. So the four aspects, and I'd just like to give you an example of each. Uh, the first one being confident humility. Now, being confident and humility at the same time is an integrative phenomenon. You're integrating seemingly two opposites. And that's what we see in ample measure in Biocon. Uh, especially by the fact that uh, any new applicant to the organization uh, is first seen by the top leadership and the managing director herself. Normally in companies, you know, you meet the managing director at the end of the entire process. Um, sometimes it's a mere formality, but not so in the case of Biocon. Biocon believes in recruiting people who are more competent than them. Uh, it believes in sharing that vision with everybody who joins the organization. And, uh, and, uh, and all of this actually is a great reflection of the confident humility. Curiosity for continuous learning. Uh, we all know that uh, the technology called BioMap, uh, the mon monoclonal antibody technology, which Kiran actually bought from a company called uh, company uh, in a country called Cuba, which was unheard of in terms of uh, the pharmaceutical sciences. But then she converted that technology into making a very prolific drug for head and neck cancer. And India, we know that is uh, you know has a number of. Uh, uh, such cases because of the tobacco chewing, uh, you know, habits. So, you, so you, as you can see that her curiosity for continuous learning led to a number of innovations, uh, challenging, uh, focusing on challenges and not tasks. Great example being the research services business of Sinjin, which where, you know, she has become the back office for a lot of scientific uh, research by the big farmers across the world. And a lot of collaboration has helped foster a lot of learning. And finally, uh, engagement uh, in the organization is a very high order, and that is largely through experimentation and freedom to fail. So there are many molecules, and we know that the pharmaceutical industry has a lot of failures, but she has been very forgiving and uh, has advised her scientists to publish papers out of failures rather than penalizing them. So in short, uh, that's the Biocon Bay for you, friends, and I would encourage that uh, you know, we read and take some lessons for it to cope up with the current ch challenges of our present day environment. Uh, so thank you, and I'll now hand over to Pallavi. Pallavi, over to you. Thank you. Can you stop the screen sharing? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish, and thank you, RG, uh, for uh, the broad spectrum of ideas that you both floated and uh, created a kind of a platform for me 
uh, me and Sushmita to come and talk about our own books. Uh, we are going through unprecedented strange times and uh, through this medium of Zoom. So it's the newness of the medium as well as the discomfort, whether we'll be able to do it or not. But I think we have pulled through. So uh, we can put a, give a pat on our back uh, as far as our experience is concerned. So I'll be talking about Anil Nayak uh, and LNT, and uh, what I will be. I hope you are able to see the slide. Yep. Yeah. All right. Um, so, from our sh series of shapers of business institution, uh, we picked up one as LNT, uh, as RJ said, Gen L company. Well, it was started much much earlier than Gen uh, liberalization, but uh, it was Mr. Nayak who reinvigorated the company, and uh, that's how we have included as part of our shaper series. I'm using a word, Anil Nayak, the intrapreneur. Well, the term intrapreneur was not in vogue at that point of time. Uh, when he joined the organization in 1965, uh, it's been more than 50 years that, uh, almost 55 years now that he joined the company, but uh, he was the true intrapreneur in the sense of the word. Uh, though he was employee, but he never thought that he was working for LNT. He was continuously thinking from day one how to take LNT to the next level and how to take LNT, how to make LNT a multinational corporation originating from India and how to achieve the next orbit. So he had what is known as orbit changing policies. By and large, what he meant by orbit, by what we mean by orbit changing policies is, normally the businesses grow in a linear fashion. When a big jump, which changes the scale of the operations, we call it orbit changing policies. And uh, Anil Nayak had this policies in form of the hardscape and the softscape. By hardscape, I mean that he invested into uh, creating the capacity. He invested into plant, machinery, equipment, and changed the scale of operation. And the first thing that he did, even when he was not in the leadership position, he created capacity in Hazira. Hazira is near Surat in Gujarat, where LNT has a large facility for production. And uh, Anil Nayak had seen this as a dream. He wanted to take LNT global as far as heavy equipment and machinery division is concerned. And so, uh, in a on a marshy land nearing the sea and the river, he chose the island chose the land and created this huge 755 acre facility over the period of 30 months. Well, this was done between 1984 and 87. And it was the first orbit changing move for LNT where LNT came out of its small fabrication business and became a large company which was dealing with nuclear, which was dealing with defense, which was dealing with um, hydrocarbon, gas, petrochemicals, and so on. And so first policy of opening a huge facility at Hazira changed the orbit for, of operations for LNT. Thereafter, once he became the CEO and MDA, MD in 1999, 
he started with Project Lakshya, where he meant to create five-year plans like government. He kept for five-year plans for the company. And in each of the five-year plans, the projects were planned, which, he, which were part of Project Lakshya and completed. So in the states of uh, uh, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Madhya Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, all over India, various facility, whether they were of shipbuilding or whether they were for defense or whether they were for gas or hydrocarbon, they were started and uh, ports were started. And uh, that gave another flip as far as uh, orbit shifting is concerned. Now, LNT's construction division, uh, soon after the liberalization, when the road sector was opened uh, for the private sector participation, LNT entered in a big way in road construction. Everything was very fine. People were happy that private sector was participating in investment in the infrastructure in the economy. LNT was also happy. What Anil Nayak observed is that the company is busy in small road projects. So he came up with a kind of a filter where he said, LNT will not take any construction project which is less than 100 crore. Meaning he cut down a large number of small projects which create a kind of a clutter in the organization they do not add this required value and people remain busy with small work. Now this was another very big orbit shifting policy uh, that Nayak followed and took LNT currently from small road, road projects to construction of airports, construction of metros, construction of huge institutional projects that they are into. And so such orbit shifting is possible where there is a visionary who is observing, as the MBA chart showed, something on the short run, something on the day-to-day -day operation, but his vision is farsighted. He is looking at the short and the long run simultaneously, and there is a vision which wants to drive the company towards the next orbit. Same is true of Softscape. Anil Nayak has always got, been called a people's person. Right from the beginning, when he joined LNT, he was friendly to everybody. He would remember with his elephantine memory names of everybody on the shop floor, everybody in the office, and he would talk to them as if they were his extended family. He never looked down upon the people and uh, that gave him the title of being a people's person. Uh, he almost remembered the names and telephone number of thousand or more than that people. And he could call the Chaiwala and the watchman and the security guard down there by their names. When I knew this, I was ashamed of myself that how many of us know the Chaiwala by his name, one who comes every day to our cabin to give us tea, or the watchman who waits for us in the society to open the door for us. We are apathetic, whereas Anil Nayak was sympathetic and empathetic, and that is the reason he got the title of being people's person. Now, when it comes to training of the people, uh, he had four favorite words. The words were devotion, passion, conviction, and commitment. He said that if you find these four qualities in people, hire him. The skill, the knowledge, the technology part of it can be taught later. There is absolutely no problem in training a person in terms of the skill development. 
that can come later. What is required is the devotion and passion. Everybody works. Everybody works for money, but very few people work are devoted to the company. And that is what matters. Everybody works and does the job, but a person has to have passion to follow the dream. And that is what differentiates a common person from a leader. And so in his entire subscape, where he wanted to have a kind of a orbit changing thing, uh, he developed a leadership development process. A leadership development process, which had uh, participants from in India, SPJIMR, we are their partners, and IIMs, where the prospective leaders are sent for training. They have the international partners in form of Harvard, London Business School, NCAD, where the participants, or rather the prospective leaders are trained. And the most important part of this entire seven stack leadership program is personal mentoring by Anil Nayak himself. He mentors each and every candidate and the final metamorphosis of that individual into a leader, a well-groomed person happens uh, at the hand of Mr. A.M. Nayak. And that's how he, uh, he told us that more than 30% of his time is spent on HR activities. No wonder the kind of involvement and the kind of contribution that he is making to the HR area to spot the right person, to bring him to the board, to train him for the job, all that is his passion. And that has made a tremendous difference. That has made LNT go to the next orbit because of that. I go to the next topic, and the topic is focus on value creation. LNT was started in 1938, and by the time Mr. Nayak came uh, as in the leadership position, it was more than 50 years old organization. LNT was very well respected organization in India because for the kind of jobs they did of nation building, of uh, dairy development, of fertilizer factory development, which helped India become self-reliant and therefore the company was very well respected. However, many a times when you are on a particular path, your business purpose gets blurred. Meaning, what is the reason for the companies to be in business? The reason is to create value for the consumers and distribute that value among the shareholders and among the workers. Mr. Nayak felt that there was something amiss. What he found that though l &T was most respected company, its share price or the return on investment that the shareholders made on the l &T shares were comparatively poor then maybe Hindustan Lever at that point of time, or Reliance at that point of time, or Colgate Pamo Lever at, at that point of time. He started searching for the reasons. And he realized that though we are doing extremely good work, but we are not paying attention to value creation. And so, as soon as he became the CEO of the company in 1999, in his first 100 days, Project Blue Chip was instituted. The Project Blue Chip meant that how l &T can bring back the focus of value creation as an integral part of the organization, how it can bring it in its DNA. And that was done by, they, they were not ashamed of not understanding the financial world. They sat down and understood the fundamental analysis. How, after all, 
share price is an outcome. So when will the share price rise? It would rise when the company's turnover rises, when its costs are kept under control and the profit margin rises. The simple thing is when the return on capital invested is high, that is where the share price would rise and that would happen under normal circumstances for all the companies. So parameters and metrics of value creation was instilled in the organization. As I said earlier, no project should be taken less than 100 crore was one of the such project which were instilled uh, in the DNA of LNT. Several cost cutting and several projects which were uh, not focused on value, value creation were either shelved or sold off and the company acquired a new focus. A new focus where they were razor sharp, they were smart, they were of course uh, value based. Uh, that was part of the DNA of LNT anyway. So they were value based. And what we saw that between 1999 and 2019, the turnover of LNT increased from 5,000 crore to 160,000 crore. This is CAGR of 19%. Imagine a company over a 20 year period is growing at CAGR of 19%. This was similar to General Electric of America where it happened under Jack Wells. And uh, market value increased from 5,800 crore to 280,000 crore, which is CAGR of 21%. This is a phase of value creation unprecedented in history of many organizations in India. If you had invested in 20 shares of LNT in 1999, for rupees 11,000, because that was the price of 20 share in 1999, the value of your investment would be today, any guesses, 2,75,000, which is the kind of return the investors received over a period of 20 years period. And Mr. Nayak was extremely happy, not only for making or taking LNT, to the next level, not only for making LNT one of the top 10 companies of the world, not only for making LNT a leading multinational corporation for India, but also a company which cares for workers as much as workers, as much as the investors. And this is what uh, differentiates the shapers from the ordinary companies or the institutions from the companies. So this is what I had to share with you in terms of how Anil Nayak changed the trajectory of LNT, and this is my humble submission. Thank you so much. I request uh, Mr. Gopal Krishnan to Come back on the screen. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our audience has listened to us. Uh, we've obviously given you just a, uh, a sense of what's in the books. Maybe uh, our shapers uh, have said a few words about their experience with the project. We can close with a four-minute video where Mr. Nayak, Ms. Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, and... Uh, uh, Mr. Ramadurai have expressed their perceptions and that will be the end of it. So why don't you just play those? It would have been lovely to have them on this, but then it's not True. possible. Yes, True. sir. Okay.
visual visual is not there okay you want me to play i'll just try once again okay A business institution is a well-run company with a few additional dimensions. A business institution is conscious of the higher responsibilities that it shoulders. It therefore has national, social, and environmental goals embedded into its agenda, while ensuring profitability and returns to stakeholders. Business institution participate in endeavors of national significance and contributes towards national goals. On the whole, therefore, India and our 1.3 billion people would be much better off if our industry had more and more business institutions. Um, Biocon actually has been a, a unique story because of the fact that it started with one person's dream and then basically grew into a shared vision along the way, with thousands of people believing in this shared purpose, this shared mission to make a difference and make global impact. And really, it is a story of building a biotech company from scratch. from the startup that it was in 1978 to then growing step by step along the way um, and in latter years growing its uh, organization to global scale and the way it was all done and the the reason why we still continue to remain the most successful and the largest biotech company in this country i think we this book actually talks about the challenges in terms of raising capital uh, grooming talent uh, accessing global opportunities global markets and of course at the end of it all it's a very complex uh, set of uh, management tasks that every organization has to address uh, in order to make that impact institution building and living its values in the true tata way we have inculcated as a part of our dna from the early stages the leadership the succession plan and the focus on the customer with the right capabilities and the technology adoption of the hallmarks the concern for the society and incorporating the stakeholders on a 360 degree basis is what this institution stands for and the growth has been sustained through some of these value systems and the investments which have been made on the people and the technology we pride ourselves on this journey of excellence and incorporated day in and day out there is always a question what is the difference between a company and an institution the company is the beginning which delivers on operational excellence day in and day out and lives the value system for the institution incorporates beyond the company to the stakeholders namely the customer the supplier and anybody including the society who become part of this journey that's why it's an institution which will continue to excel continue to focus on all the uh, stakeholders very clearly and at all times
thank you all very much. The books are available on Kindle uh, as well as uh, in the bookstores when they open. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Ashish, would you want to say th something? Ashish is not there. Fine. All right. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You all. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.